This will be a little bit of a different type of problem though to illustrate something a little bit unique. The question is, uh, you want to find a 98% confidence interval for the proportion of college students who get a student loan. Um, you read estimates that around 78% do get a loan, um, but you want, uh, you want your max error to be around 5% for this confidence interval that you're doing. How many samples do you need? So see, we've turned the problem around. Usually we tell you how many samples, we tell you the data, uh, we tell you the confidence level, and you have to go construct the confidence interval. Here, we're actually telling you that we want the maximum error in our confidence interval to be around 5%. And we know everything else, but now we're trying to figure out how many samples do we need. See, that's a very common sort of thing when you're doing these uh, things in the real world. You want to take a survey and you want to create a confidence interval, but you need to know how many people do you need to ask. So we need to start from the beginning because it's not really obvious exactly how to do this. But you know that the level, uh, I'm sorry, that the uh, margin of error is equal to this critical value of z, basically this equation that we've used many times over 1 minus p and then we have n here. All right. So this is the sample proportion, this is the number of samples, and this is the critical value here. But what we're actually asked is we're, we're trying to find out how many samples do I need? That's the number n. How many samples? That's the number n. So really we have the equation that involves n, the margin of error, the level of confidence, and the proportion. So it involves everything, but we don't actually want to find e. We want to find what n is. How, what is the maximum number of um, or how many samples do I need to actually pull this off? That's what I want to do. So what we really want to do is solve this equation for n, right, this guy, which is not only in the denominator of a fraction, but it's also inside of the square root, right? So you know, a lot of students ask me and email me over the years, and they, they ask me, when will I ever use algebra? When will I ever use algebra? Well, this is a great example. Your problem is not given to you in such a way that you can use this equation the way it is. You need to rearrange and solve for n so that you can solve the answer. And, and nobody's going to tell you how to do that. You just need to know the rules of algebra to actually do it. So let's do that. First of all, we want to get inside of this square root because everything else is inside of it. We, can't, we have to work outside to inside. All right, so the first thing we can do is we can square both sides because remember if we square the left hand side we can do anything we want to the left and the right hand side of an equation as long as we do it to both sides. So let's square the left hand side and that's going to give us e squared. When we square the right hand side you can think of this as being a term and then this thing with the square root being a term. So then you're going to apply the square to z sub c and that's going to be squared. But then when you apply the square to this thing you have a giant square root and if you remember when you square a square root they're like opposites of each other. They cancel each other out. So really all that happens here is the radical disappears or the square root sign disappears. So what you'll have is p 1 minus p hat over n. Make sure you understand the step because this is that was the most important step of the whole thing. You can do anything you want to both sides of an equation. So we square the left hand side, we square the right hand side. When we, when we square the right hand side we end up squaring this term and then we square also this term but all that happens here is we just get rid of the square root sign. Alright and now we want to solve for n. So before we can do anything in here we need to get rid of this that's out front. So we divide both sides by z sub c squared. So we get e squared over z sub c squared is equal to p hat, and then we'll have, well, we can take the parentheses away now, 1 minus p hat over n. Make sure you understand this. We want to get, these are multiplied together, don't forget, when it's just sitting here, it's multiplied. So the opposite of multiplication is division. So we divide both sides of this equation by z sub c squared. On the right hand side, it goes away because we've divided it out. On the left hand side, that's why we have it underneath the e squared here because we're dividing both sides. So we get to this step. All right. Now we want to solve for this, and the easiest way to do this is to multiply both sides of this equation by n. So effectively, all we're really doing is we're multiplying the right by n and we're multiplying the left by n. So on the left, we're going to have um, n e squared over z sub c squared. And on the right hand side these ends cancel. They just kind of cancel out because your one's on top and one's on bottom. So what you have is p hat 1 minus p hat. Now we're almost done. We, we want n by itself. That's what we're trying to do. And so what we're going to do next 
is we're going to multiply both sides by z sub c squared. So we'll have n e squared. Multiply the left by z sub c squared, it disappears. The right, it's going to be um, z sub c squared p hat, 1 minus p hat, right? So we just multiply the left and the right by z sub c squared. It canceled on the left. And now finally we divide by e squared. So we have n is equal to z sub c squared over e squared times p hat 1 minus p hat, okay? And if you want to make it absolutely explicit, you can just take this out just to, if you're more comfortable and you can just extend the fraction over. So basically what we've done, we divide by e squared. Everything on the right just stays on top. The e squared just goes in the bottom. I know that I've done a lot of these steps and you may be saying, well, why do I care about this? I'm in a statistics class. But you know, a lot of times you're gonna have to, to know when you can manipulate things. If any step in here is totally foreign, then you really need to review some algebra. There's nothing here that's crazy. Basically, in this step, we square both sides of the equation because we can do anything we want to both sides. That makes this squared, that makes this squared, and that makes this drop the radical because they're opposites. Okay, now we want to get rid of this. So we divide both sides by this term. That's why it becomes in the bottom here and it disappears from the right. Then we multiply both sides by n. Multiply by n, multiply by n. That brings an n over here and that cancels an n from this side. You see what we're trying to do is isolate n. So once we get it over here, then we multiply by z sub c squared, that brings it over here, and then we divide by e squared, that brings it on the bottom. Ultimately, all we cared about doing was getting n by itself. All right, now, why do we care about that? Let me go off to the next board, and I'll just rewrite it. n is equal to z sub c squared p hat, one minus p hat, uh, over e squared. Now, from the problem, from the problem statement, we know that the margin of error that we're comfortable with is 5%, which is 0 0.05. That's given to us. We know that we want a 98% confidence interval, and, if, and that's going to correspond to what? 98% confidence interval is going to correspond to a critical value of z of 2.33. So what this means is z sub c is 2.33. p hat, it says in the problem actually right here, it says um, you read estimates that around 78% do get a student loan. So this is just an estimate that around 78% get a student loan, which is 0 0.78. You want to make sure and use the decimal version in your problem. And then we go down here and we say, well, the sample size that you need is z sub c squared, which we were given this 2.33. Let's go ahead and square that here. p hat 0.78, 1 minus p hat, 1 minus 0 0.78. And on the bottom is the margin of error 0 0.05 squared, okay? So 2.33 squared, 0.78, 1 minus 0.78, and 0.05 squared. And so what you're going to end up with on the top when you square this and multiply and do the subtraction and multiply it all through, you get 0 0.932. On the bottom when you square this, you'll get 0, 0.025. And what you'll actually get when you divide these two, I'll switch colors, is you'll get 372.6. And you can just round up because you can't have a fraction of a sample. So you round up and you can say 373 samples needed. Now, why did I do this problem? Well, because honestly, doing confidence intervals, once you do enough of them, they're all very similar. If you're just being asked to calculate the confidence interval, you've got to get your sample data that's in the middle, margin of error, subtract, margin of error, add, boom, you're done. So let's mix it up a little bit. Let's do something a little bit different. In this case, we're given all the information, including an estimate for the sample uh, margin of error and for the um, estimates that around 78% get aid. That means that's basically telling you what the point estimate really is, okay? And we're trying to find out how many samples we need. Now, this equation that we solved here, you may actually see this in your book somewhere. It may be in your book, but most books aren't gonna actually do it to show you where it comes from. All that's happening is you're starting from what you have to begin with and you're rearranging to find something that you can calculate here. This, z sub c squared, comes from the margin of error. This comes from the sample data. This comes from 
the margin of error. And in this case, we said we wanted a 5% margin of error. And then we know now that if we're going to do this, then we, can, we need at least 373 samples if we're going to do this experiment and get, and get, these, get the information the way we want. And that's why it's useful. Sometimes when you're doing a study, you need to know how many people to ask. So you do a back of the envelope calculation to figure out how many people to ask. And then you go and actually do the, do the uh, sampling. All right, so we've done in this lesson confidence intervals and, and the previous couple lessons, confidence intervals of proportions. All right, in the last volume of Mastering Statistics, we've also done uh, confidence intervals of the mean, small samples, large samples. Next section, we're going to do confidence intervals with sample variance, sample standard deviation. Now, in order to cover that, I'm going to have to cover a lot of basic material first before we can get to because it's a little bit different than what we've done here. It's not hard. It's just a little bit different. So follow me on to the next lesson where we'll start to go down that journey with confidence intervals. And then once we master that, we'll go straight into hypothesis testing. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.